Hi, I'm Johanna Hedva. Welcome. I am joined by my dear friend Asher Hartman, and today we're going to talk about my new book, Minerva the Miscarriage of the Brain. This event is being co hosted by $2 Radio and X Artist Books. Asher, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Asher Hartman, and I am a uh, psychic, a writer, a director, and also um, an author of um, a book published by X Artist Books, Mad Clot. That came October. out in May, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Woo! yeah, yeah <laughs> yes. um, and I'm here to, to talk to my dear friend, Johanna. So, yes. Yes, yeah, so maybe just very briefly, um, we can set the stage. Asher and I have known each other and collaborated and worked together um, since 2011. Um, and we've also, if we haven't collaborated outright, we've worked in very similar worlds, um, mostly in Los Angeles performance art. Um, and I thought that you would be the perfect person to talk about this book because this book is a collection of a decade of my work. Um, it includes performance, uh, performances that you have seen, um, performances that I directed with actors from your company. Um, it includes a lot of similarities in terms of place, um, streets, intersections, particular rooms that we have uh, worked in together. Um, and so, yeah, maybe just to uh, explain it very briefly, Minerva, the miscarriage of the brain uh, is a decade of work and it includes poems, performances, plays, an encyclopedia, um, essays. And what's interesting about it, I guess, is that for several years I tried to <clears throat> make it one thing like I tried to make it a poetry book and I tried to make it a performance documentation archive and I tried to make it a book of essays and none of them ever worked um, as such and they only started it only started to work as a book when it became all of those things and so none of them um, and I guess like the thing I talk about with it is that at some point it just proved its lawlessness to me um, it also had a very cursed journey coming into the world. I first tried to get it published in 2016. Um, it was accepted by a place, given a publication date, rah, 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 and then that place went bankrupt. So I sent it back out again, and it was accepted and held for a year and a half before it was ultimately dropped. So one of the other connections that we have is that when that um, happened to me, I kind of had to regroup. And one of the people that I asked for advice was Alexander Grant, the uh, founder of your publisher, X Artist Book. Yeah. And I asked her, I basically just sent the manuscript to her as a friend and was like, would you just tell me what I should do? Like, should I try to do, get this published? It's already been, you know, it's already been cursed twice. Should I just wait until I die and then someone can find it in my papers or whatever? <laughs> um, and she was really, really, really supportive as she is and said, you know, I would publish this. I couldn't do it this year, but um, if you want it to come out um, sooner, you should try Vivian Sming with Sming Sming Books, who is someone I went to CalArts with. Um, and she now runs a press by herself up in the bay Amazing. called Sming Sming Books. It also, she also produces objects, um, artists, edition objects, records. So um, I think that Alexandra had her plate full at X Artist Books for me because she was working on your book. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. She's what a amazing. generous, loving and 360 degree vision person yeah. Alexandra is, you know, yeah. she's amazing. We have that in common and we have <clears throat> Machine Project in common in LA. We have Machine Project in common, which is the nonprofit uh, performance zany collective space on Alvarado and Sunset that most of the performances that I've ever made in, in LA were supported by the machine. 
I also worked there behind the scenes for four years as a grant writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the things that were happening in Minerva um, happened while I was involved with Machine Project. Yeah, and the incredible inventive Mark Allen. And this is how we know each other because Mark was helping you like hire some people to work for your play, see what love the father has given us. Yeah, and, and that, that's, we met on that production. Yeah. Um, on the, um, the corner of Alvarado and Sunset in Los Angeles. Yes. Um, which I think it would be fun to talk about Los Angeles, the performance world, those performances that opened the book and your experience um, making work um, and putting your body in work and putting other people's bodies in work, particularly on that, on that corner. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was threatening and I'll do it to say that I will always remember when you gave me a psychic reading as we were walking from Machine Project across Alvarado to the Burrito King and we were waiting in the line at the burrito king and you were like i'm just gonna go in there and see, see what spirit has to say <laughs> oh my god that burrito king i remember what, so looking great. at there one evening and there was somebody i just saw a leg in the corner <laughs> and somebody pulling up like i don't know a sheet of holy meat and it, i mean that in both ways <laughs> <laughs> with tongs but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that intersection particularly so machine project was there the storefront was there and then they had a an apartment above mm -hmm. and one of the essays in minerva man church um talks about how that uh apartment in my opinion is haunted as fuck um do you want to talk about that a little bit like, what yeah experience there <laughs> Well, yeah, so it was interesting because I had had several experiences in that apartment, but they didn't sort of coalesce into anything um, until I found myself talking with Henry Hoke, actually, who was putting on, I think, something at Machine Project that involved that apartment. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do something about haunted houses. And I was like, well, you know, that apartment is haunted. And he was like, really? And then I found myself telling this story of all of these uh, experiences I had had up there. And he was like, you should write that down. And so I did, and it's um, the essay man church in the collection. Yeah. Um, it's also the first time I met C.A. Conrad. They stayed up in that apartment and I remember them billowing down Alvarado in a purple robe. <laughs> <laughs> I was like working, you know, in, in the storefront and then they were like, oh, that's our poet in residence, C.A. Conrad. This is like in 2011 or something, um, 2012 or 13, maybe. Yeah. And for people who haven't been there, that that intersection is really just a smoke filled. Yeah, it's like a portal to hell. Yeah, it's very noisy. You can't really sleep there. Um, I don't really know what else goes on in that apartment building i think just nine normal nice people trying to live there but maybe you had other it, experiences well so that particular essay talks about an event where i was staying there and ran into someone who i had known from my past who happened to be living in the next door apartment to the machine project apartment and this was somebody that i had uh, well, I had, I was doing a performance piece that involved him. And during the performance piece, I felt for the first time, maybe in my life overcome, and this is totally serious, like overcome with a homicidal urge to kill him. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of, you know, terrified me at the time. I like ran away and didn't talk to him for, you know, I just like stopped doing the performance in the middle of it and ran out. And um, I think coming to terms with that murderous rage was what writing Man Church was about, was realizing, you know, that I had in me a capacity to want to kill someone, mm -hmm. like in not a joke, joke way. Mm -hmm. um, he represented just like everything about <clears throat> cis, hetero, patriarchal men that, you know, 
as a system is something that I feel very strongly against, but I had in that moment, it kind of crystallized into this one individual person sitting in front of me, mm -hmm. enacting all of it mm -hmm. in his, in his body and his behavior and his, what he believed himself to be entitled to. <clears throat> and yeah. So I was overcome with murderous rage and it was a weird um, kind of confluence that then happened. I think it was two years later that I was staying in the machine project apartment briefly and he happened to be next door. And I found out because he, I was like awoken by some, no, it was in the middle of the day. There was just really loud fucking sounds coming from his place. Like, and really kind of porn, like violent sounds. And then like the next day I ran into him in the front. I was like, oh, hey, it's you. And he was like, yeah, what's up? Like, what are you doing these days? And I was like, I'm staying up there. And he was like, no shit, I'm like right there. So all of, you know, like, you know, I was like, oh my God, I wanted to kill you. And now we're just like, we like LA, like you're in the next door. Isn't that a strange thing though, that wanting to kill somebody and having that deep, clear impulse and this is very LA, and then maybe a couple of years later, like, what's up, how's it going, you know? Well, one of my favorite tweets I think I've ever seen is that if you've lived in LA long enough, someone who hurt your feelings will end up on a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Yeah, it's true, it's happened to me. That is so funny. But I'm wondering, maybe this is too far um, afield, but that understanding that murderous rage is that is that something that can connect you in a sense to the, the to Greek mythology and the purity of emotion in Greek mythology? Yes, because so the other thing that's happening in Minerva is like the, one of the biggest um, kind of pieces in it is an essay that I wrote about a four year project where I adapted and directed um, four ancient Greek, three ancient Greek tragedies and one uh, chapter from the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them had to do with this uh, way of trying to deal with rage and pain and trauma um, that was both individual but also political or produced by some political condition. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I remember when I was doing those plays, I like really needed some place to cathart my own trauma and rage. And I am kind of a, you know, I, I don't really want to endorse Aristotle, but I do feel like he had, he was onto something with the catharsis idea, you know, of this thing that, you know, this sorceress kind of communal alchemy that happens um, when you're watching theater or performance um, that does something very uh personal in terms of your own emotional transformation but then you also get to do that with other people mm -hmm. um i think i'm very invested in that idea and i haven't made a performance with other people in several years but i spent about 10 years making them and i think it was also a way to deal with all of you know i mean the performers i worked with we you know collaborated very equally and they brought all of their own pain and rage and desire and joy that they needed to, you know, work with. Yeah, I mean, I think about Odyssey, Odyssey, like in terms of embodying, you know, because they're, you're literally in a vehicle with a couple yeah. of other people. This is my Homer's Odyssey and a Honda Odyssey. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing and very risky, very perilous, in fact. You know, a lot of times we talk about performances being risk-taking. I think this one was literally perilous yeah it was it was properly dangerous i mean because also because the driver was um one of the performers and there you know one of the other performers was hiding in the back and had to pop out in the middle and there was a hard break moment on a big dramatic climax um in the middle of the street and yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's uh, to be clear like there i think how many audience members at one time like one or two or two there were four performers for two audience members mm -hmm. per show and mm -hmm. we would do two shows a night and we had a three-week 
run. Mm -hmm. And so each performance, two audience members are in this vehicle with the performers going, and we're talking about that same intersection of Sunset and Alvarado and the surrounding hills. Yeah, the Vons. It starts in the Vons. Starts in the Vons. Uh, yes. The parking lot. Yes. And then you go up all these hills and you're kind of like, yeah. You move, your yeah. body is lurching back and forth. Well, and I remember feeling very triumphant one show because there was in the audience supposedly this like very extreme German performance artist was coming to see the show and I was also hiding in the back um as the director I, at some point I realized like oh I have to be in the car too because like how am I going to know what happens how am I going to like give notes unless I'm there <laughs> um and I remember this guy at some point Odysseus is like you know crazed and spastic and he threatens to piss on Calypso in the in the van and I remember the German performance artist being like now they have gone too far <laughs> 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 and we were all like after the show like yeah like victory <laughs> that is so good that's hilarious oh my god but I mean, that's really like total embodiment for performer and for audience member. So I want to ask you because because the book, whenever it's so so bodily, you know, there's so many fragments of bodies, entanglements, pieces of bodies. What is it like to embody? I mean, why put your body in a book? Why put your body in a performance? Why put other people's bodies in a performance? What's that about? I, you, you emailed me and said, why put your body in anything? And I was like, this is maybe the question of the history of the world. I mean, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, um, I do feel on some level that the history of the world is trying to fucking deal with this thing we call the body. Mm -hmm. um, because it's kind of a drag, you know, like, I feel like as, as you come into your sense of yourself, um, as a kid and then into adulthood and whatever agency you have that's also happening inwardly in terms of like oh if I don't eat then I'll feel bad at the same time that you're learning how other people on the other side of your body and your face are reacting to it and what it means in society what the value you know is placed on you based on race and gender and all of these things and I just think that that's met equally ferociously with this internal conundrum of like, oh, you know, like embodiment, like, and now I have this, I have to make a decision about my hair and, you know, these kinds of things that are actually very um, bound up in identity. Mm -hmm. Of course, identity doesn't, you know, it's never fixed. So I think that's the other thing is that being in a body or just watching this thing change all the time. Like the minute you have a handle on it, it's going to be different. Yeah. And there's a sense of in the book of things kind of moving around, sliding around, being entangled. And in the performances, I mean, obviously we talked about Odyssey, Odyssey but also Medea, the question of who is, who is Medea? Um, and what is this kind of entanglement with the idea of mother or woman um, or gender or being or being the foreigner or, you know, being the, the person that's outcast, et cetera. Um, there, it's very salient in, in all of your works um, and, and both, you know, literary works and non-fictional, you know, essays or theories. Um, so it just, pretty fascinating to me how you conceive of the body. Like, what is the body to you? I mean, is that a too big of a question? No, I think it's a drag. Um, and I mean that both like, it's a kind of this like painful, awkward, frustrating, expensive thing you have to deal with. And also drag in the drag sense. Mm -hmm. It's this, you know, really, I don't want to say can palette or canvas because that seems 2D, mm -hmm. but it's this thing that you get to kind of build, right? And you get to decorate it and construct it and kind of create a character. I think that one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by actors is this embodiment of that can change, right? And particularly body language and voice and gesture that 
that means something about an interiority. Mm -hmm. Like the thing that actors are so amazing at is communicating a story through their body. Mm -hmm. And yes, as a playwright and as a you know writer, like they you know speak the words that they are given for that piece. But actors, you know, of anybody, I think, are some of the most embodied. Like they don't need words to actually communicate, which is one of the things that I find so fascinating about them. And you also have said that you would, in another life, or if you were doing something else, you would be an actor. Is that true? Yeah, it would be cool. I'm too shy and broken. But <laughs> at this point, uh, but yeah, I think that there's a there's an interesting thing about you know some actors, not all actors, but they have a the, the property of shape shifting, or having spirit or beings slide into them, or kind of interlocking with those beings, and um, and language, you know, particularly in, in some some forms of playwriting, is a real channel to that or vehicle for that. And I think that's true for for the production of Medea, you know. And right, you asked me about Medea. I should maybe. Yeah. Can I should maybe that? mention. Yeah. Um, so my Medea was called She Work, and it was performed. It was written specifically and performed by um, Nichols Sunshine, who um, is gender queer and uh, mixed race Latinx. And they had seen my adaptation of Alice Justice, which was at PAM, which is the space in Highland Park run by Brian Getnick and Peter Hernandez. Like, I just want to also say all the names of everyone we love. Um, yeah. So Nichols saw that show and came up to me afterward and was like, I would just love to work with you. They are a dancer and a choreographer. And I was like, I'd love to work with you. And Nichols was like, well, I want to be a queen. And I was like, I know exactly which one you should be. And so we started to work on Medea. I was so attracted to the story of Medea because, you know, she's like the original feminine anti-hero. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yes, it's like kind of by now old hat to talk about how Don Draper and Tony Soprano and all these dudes are like talked about as being anti-heroes, but women in lead roles never get to be as fucked up and messy and evil and all of this stuff. But Medea really was this like original kind of um, within the Western, I think, canon. I mean, she kind of stands out as not, you know, like Antigone is really righteous. Like she has a reason to do the thing she does. Whereas Medea's cause is totally just, but her maybe reaction her is like a little too much. I mean, sure, you know, that's the thing is like, what I love about her is you're like, well, but she's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, her, you know, she's, a, she's not, so the Greeks, you know, invented xenophobia. I mean, they, they were the original ones to say, well, if you're not from here, you're obviously a barbarian. So she was a barbarian who was, um, who married into the Greek royal family. And then Jason, her king husband, divorces her for a younger, more beautiful Greek woman which means that her citizenship is now gone because she had sacrificed, she had given it up, um, her homeland to marry him. And her children also will be exiled. So on some level, you know, when she kills them, you kind of like, I mean, I, I, mean, I think of it as like, you, it makes sense, like on some level. Here, like so far now I've advocated for murder like twice in this <laughs> talk. Just fictional. <laughs> Yeah, fictional uh, but, murder. I'm really a fan but, of fictional murder. <laughs> but what what was what do you think attracted you specifically to this story, like her story? Well, she, she's always talked about as having female rage, right? Like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, and I always thought that that was, you know, like what does that mean? Like, isn't rage just rage? Like, maybe it's political based on what it's about. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if there's really a difference that is of any interesting thing to me. Yeah. But I think that, you know, for a woman like Medea in her time and her situation, the way that she can express her rage is, you know, by killing her children. This is like, what she has kind of, it's like the equipment that she has mm -hmm. in that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I just rewatched Venom, which <laughs> I had seen in the theater, the Tom Hardy superhero film. Oh, I um, didn't actually see I that. see all of these movies like in the theater multiple times. Like I know all about, but I see every single movie like that comes out in the theater. Um, it's the only thing that COVID has made me upset about is not going to the movies every every week. But anyway, the character that is playing his like girlfriend, ex-girlfriend in the movie, she's like, well, I know how to fight dirty, you know, like, like I can do that. And all she's doing at the end when she says, you know, I told you I could fight dirty is she's like using the one weapon that humans have against these alien monsters. I'm like, how is that fighting dirty? Like, it's the only thing that will kill them. But wait, <laughs> what is that? Because I didn't see the movie. Oh, it's this, like, it's so, it's like a frequency, a sound frequency that if, so basically these alien monsters are, are a symbiote parasite thing that attaches itself to humans and they will detach if this frequency is played. Oh, what is the frequency? Is it a high note? It's like a high pitch, yeah, I think. And so she plays this when the big final climactic battle is happening. And she's like, I told you I could fight dirty. And I'm like, this is literally the only way to fight them. How is that dirty? <laughs> that's dirty. Like, that's but because it's, yeah, because she's a blonde girl in a skirt, right. like that's what, that's dirty fighting. Right. Anyway, maybe we're... I mean, no, I think it's, it, I think rage is actually a very interesting topic for the moment. And it seems to ride through your work and ride through this book in particular. I mean, and we're just talking about female rage at the moment. Um, and I wonder how that characterizes this time for you, if at all, or if the book was cathartic to you, speaking of catharsis. Um, and also very interested in your understanding of and take on catharsis in performance and and theater in general. So any of those questions I would be interested in knowing about. Well, the other thing I was just, um, I mean, I, I think that if I started to talk about how enraged I am about the current time, I would, we would be here for a couple more years. Um, one of the things too that I kind of am thinking about, I also recently rewatched the Martin Scorsese um, Age of Innocence uh, which is one of, I think, my favorites of his. Mm -hmm. But he has said that that's the most violent of his films. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting comment to make coming from a man who's made the kinds of movies he's, he's made to talk about like this sort of drawing room psychological feminine manipulation game as being the most violent. Um, I guess like, I mean, on an astrological level, my Mars is very empowered and also debilitated at the same time. I have a Mars in Scorpio, but it's retrograde in the 12th house, which basically like takes the most powerful kind of warrior rage monster mm -hmm. and then like buries it in an iceberg. And it's like, okay, feel all the same feelings, but they're like frozen in there. So in some ways it, produces more, longer rage. Um, it's not very healthy, but <laughs> it's like 10 years after the fact, I'm like, oh, I'm so mad about that thing. I just realized, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's taken me a long time to, in astrology, there's a technique with a planet that is debilitated where you want to quote unquote remediate it. And it basically just means this planet needs a little extra help to do what it wants to do. Mm. Um, and so in my case, my, I need a little extra help to be allowed to feel rage when I feel it and in my body. Um, mm. So I think that I have made performances that particularly deal with that. And in, and also in writing, I mean, I think my first book on hell is just a big, you know, scream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the other thing that it makes me think of is I talk a lot of the time about what I do, no matter what it is, if it's performance or art or music or whatever, as being writing, because mm -hmm. I think of writing as just being language embodied. Mm -hmm. So it's words on a page, but it's also words coming out of a voice. 
um, you know, a voice speaking into a room, it's screaming in a room, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean. Oh, I was going to ask, do you, do you, I mean, this is a kind of a corny question, but do you think that you channel when you write or that you're attached or connected to some other force or form? You know, you're one of the people that has made me think about that because you do. Mm -hmm. And I remember also you were, um, you kind of made me think about performance in theater um, in terms of ritual mm. um, in a way that I had never really thought about before. Working with you and talking with you about your practice over these years has made me think about that. I think that generally with performance, because you do it again and again and again, there is always this element of ritual and what that means. Mm. Um, I don't particularly feel like I channel when I write, although I think that's probably a good word for it. It seems like, I'm sorry to say this because I know that's not the case, but sometimes it feels effortless. Like the, the phrase that follows the next phrase or the word that comes next, it feels absolutely effortless. Like it had to evolve there on the page in that way. Um, You're like making me feel really happy. I'm just going to have to <laughs> pull out my fan. <laughs> but I mean, it's I'm that, it is, it, in it, this it, it will do because it, everything feels like it evolved. And I think that's the, maybe the right word for it. They are naturally on the page because it comes out of the body in a particular way through maybe a, a particular aspect of the body. Um, even an artery or, a, you know, a molar or, you know, half of the brain and it just so, half, just half <laughs> a chunk, a tiny, look a little frag, oh. <laughs> a fragment, a singular gyrus around and around, <laughs> you know, like it, 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 and then it kind of becomes there on the page, which I think is really quite startling and beautiful and feels like there is a connection to some aspect of what we would call the divine in the process mm. but also i'm curious how easy is it for you to stay in your body is it difficult um it's well i actually think that i'm very good at being in my body because i have no choice i have an existence that is you know conditioned by various chronic illnesses and chronic pain which put me in my body kind of whether I want to be or not mm. I'm very good at being out of my body also and I feel like these are equally they don't happen at the same time obviously mm -hmm. one is happening very strongly mm. and then the other happens um honestly it's just like so nice to hear you say that the phrases feel effortless or the sentences like feel effortless because they're not at all that I would assume. so not at all like I I write a lot I used to think I was a fast writer and then I like met a fa met fast writers and I was like oh right I'm like not at all fast <laughs> um I write 500 words a day no matter what mm -hmm. um but I so like to get to the right sentence to get to the right word takes me a very long time I generate a lot I revise I mean, like I, like, you know, this piece that came out earlier this year, um, I went through 72 drafts of this piece. Um, when I'm writing a sentence, I write usually on my computer for my 500 words. Mm -hmm. Any word I put down, particularly nouns, adjectives, and verbs, <laughs> pronouns are like articles, not so much, mm -hmm. but any word that needs to do anything, I look it up in the dictionary, I look it up in the etymology dictionary, and I look it up in the thesaurus before I like decide this is the one. Mm. Um, for every fucking word. Have you ever been shocked or surprised at the etymology? Absolutely. And actually, I think that the etymology is the one that I rely on the most. Mm -hmm. Like usually I started with a thesaurus kind of like, I need another word for amazing, you know? <laughs> Yes, um, do. as we do um so i'm like looking around in the thesaurus about what i can do here but then i go to like 
like often the etymology just takes me to exactly what I need to say, mm -hmm. which is the original, you know, kind of meaning of it. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, like, that's why I guess I say, like, I don't feel like it's channeling because it feels like so hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know? Think it can be a combo, though, you know, I'm not trying to well, make you a channeler, but. Well, can you, can I ask, can you talk about what you channel when you write? I mean, I've seen some of your writing that you've just, you know, that's like kind of fresh out of like, right after you've written it. Um, yeah. And but it's I, remarkable. Oh, I, I mean, that's the spirit. Because you're channeling. So yeah, you don't, you don't take credit, right? Like you say that it's something else. That's yeah. Funny. But then, then you have to make it into something and that then requires um the research and the, uh, trying to understand what you're saying etc but sometimes it's i i maybe this is uh, evidence of being not a great writer but i can't go back on what was channeled like even mm -hmm. and i'll be shocked sometime okay well what is this word and then i'll try to understand its origins and then it is like mm -hmm. oh what how would i how would i have understood that and i'm not saying i'm some kind of channeling genius it simply is amazing to me that this information is either within us or in you know the larger network of of conversations that we're having as humans um so i find it you know i find it kind of stunning sometimes because that i'm not that smart and i'm not saying that my writing is smart either but you know like something's coming through me and it feels like that and it definitely felt like that in on in on hell like there was mm -hmm. another being there that was, mm -hmm. was, but I mean, of course, I'm not in any way discounting research and rewriting and all of that, that also goes into that kind of writing. But you also, when you're writing a play, you're channeling for the different characters, right? Like the characters I feel like in your work are, are these archetypal, mm -hmm. you know, they like, they're like a host for various, energies and thoughts and ideas and histories and you know and and what's cool about how you work with your performers your actors is you work with them for years and the process is this kind of ritualistic kind of communal you know all of you make the play together mm -hmm. um but you're kind of like the godhead that's I think of you well, yeah. I mean, we can't get into all the astrology, but I remember I saw your chart and I was like, oh, you're not a mystic, you're a god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it is, it, it, yeah, I guess it's complicated, you know, because I do think, you know, as a psychic, and maybe we can talk a little bit about. Our, that that other aspect of of what we do. I mean, I use the word intuitive, but psychic is the list, maybe the crasser term that has the most baggage. But um, I do feel. I mean, I don't feel. I know we are deeply connected, and that we see and know each other. Um, if we wish to, often we don't. Uh, on ways that are so intimate and so shared, and and just thinking about embodiment, for example, or the body itself. For me, like the body is slippery and, and they're and slighty, I guess, and there are many forms of self that enter into when I'm, if so for example, reading someone, um, they're not a singular entity. Although mm -hmm. you're right, and I, you make me think about this expensive thing that we have to maintain called the body that we have to feed and house, hopefully, and um, kind of tr try to create a, 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 a tent of survival for. But inside of that, it feels like there are many portals and doors, which is really a clumsy analogy, but mm. you know, beings coming and going in, in that body for many times, mm. you know, not, not only this time for sure, or not only this planet for sure. I think that in astrology, the analogy or the analogous uh, way of conceptualizing that is that in your natal chart, you know, there are all these planets and, it, you know, the planets correspond to the gods. I mean, they were named after the gods and goddesses that were, you know, in that time in the ancient world. They were multiplicitous. They were everywhere. They were around the corner. They were, you know, agential in a very deep way. They had 
plans for you and desires of their own and that would get thwarted by some other god and so the idea i think of that as a natal chart is that you know well like when i work with astrology clients i always tell them like i believe in fate but i don't believe in this christian kind of hollywood idea of fate that there's like this one plan this destiny for you and that's it and you could you have to like have free will and go against it no like the idea of fate to me is changing all of the time maybe the god of war has the upper hand in your life right now but he's going to get in a fight with the god of time maybe he's going to lose mm. you know now mm. the god of time is in the driver's seat now you like you have to be beholden to him or you could maybe decide to not you know and then this other thing will happen mm. i think that that's the thing about you know ancient greek mythology and and tragedy in this, this literature is that it really shows these forces you know converging and diverging with each other in all these different scenarios mm -hmm. so maybe to talk about that multiplicitousness and everybody is like in astrology i would say like oh, okay so your mercury is very strong but you know he's also squaring off with this completely other force uh you know or whatever it's so amazing it's amazing the intersection between your your writing your interest in the greeks your astrological practice and the way you live your life um super fascinating to me you know oh well yeah. i always joke that you and i are the los angeles like art world spiritual advisors because <laughs> i feel like all Studio of our clients are the same star. people <laughs> oh my god your readings are unbelievable they're just well your readings are i mean we can just devolve into like <laughs> total nice. gushing but your readings i mean saved my life i mean many times no. every reading that, i mean i mentioned your readings in this book because you had read for me in the machine project basement um right after i did the odyssey play and you were like oh i see it the next play you're going to do is alcestis and I was like, who's that? <laughs> and then I did it. I, I went home and looked her ass up and I was like, oh, I definitely have to do this as the next play. It's amazing. That's so yeah. cool. Uh, yeah. And uh, we were going to talk a little bit about the LA performance scene and it's COVID demise. Yeah. In ways. Yeah. One of the things that has been kind of... Um, I mean, sad is, I guess, the, is the most blunt word for it is how Minerva is coming out. And I realize that so many of the places that the performances, you know, that are documented in this book, so many of the places where they happened are now gone. Machine Project is no longer. Peter's space is no longer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Many spaces. Tex is, I think maybe that's the, I mean, yes, it's sad that these art spaces leave, but there's something about Tex that is also like really deeply sad to me because Tex is the restaurant that's like right around the corner. So after every performance, after every show, we would all go over to Tex for a drink. And there's something about working with actors and the camaraderie and the family that you feel with them. Also, I just remember one time we had this fabulous show and we went to Tex and we drank and then we like went to a party that was down in Echo Park somewhere. And I remember, I don't know if you kind of hung out for the party, but I remember at some point my actors and I were all on the dance floor and one of them swung over to me and was shirtless and was like, everyone thinks we're on ecstasy, but we were just in a play. <laughs> I love that. That is that feeling of making something yeah. and making something public li with yeah. live bodies. Yeah. Um, there's no substitute for it, you know? I know. I'm a huge advocate for accessibility in Zoom and how Zoom is sort of now in COVID, like made people aware of things that the disabled community has been asking for for a long time. 100%. And yet I also feel like there's just no substitute for being in a room with people 
and especially if you care about these people or you care about the work that they're trying to make you know like being in the audience is as you know amazing as being on the stage yeah and it's and it's as an an important uh, role as the actor or the the writer or director etc um i don't think people necessarily take that into account that when you are there you're not merely a witness you're very much a part of what's going on and you are asked to be available to it and i think that's very difficult for people sometimes because the vulnerability in that role can be overwhelming for people uh, because you're feeling other people's feelings and you're being watched feeling your feelings, particularly in a performance when you're not necessarily yeah. in a giant theater yeah. where there are lots of people in the room, like, um, you know, being in your apartment, watching uh, a production where the performer is, you know, right, right here, um, yeah. you know, or being in um, a gallery space or, um, you know, some other venue where, where the feelings... The, the ritualistic, uh, I think, you know, aspect of performance is felt. Um, and I don't know that we always take that into account. And I agree with you, though. I think Zoom, in fact, and uh, FaceTime and those other, those other portals, if you will, are incredible. You know, I know we, we complain about them um, because they are exhausting, but I actually find them they're better portals than being face to face with people. It's true. People, I think, are willing to be open in a way, maybe because they're in the comfort of their own home, you know, quote unquote. Like we were joking that from here down, we're not wearing any clothes. <laughs> from here up, we both look great. <laughs> wow. Speak for yourself. Wait, can we talk about teeth? Yes. Yes. Tell me about teeth. Tell me about veins. I find all of these things, I like, I think my favorite genre is body horror, because I don't think it's like fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like teeth to me are one of the most like, I don't know, product, like I'm so stressed out about my teeth all the time, like they produce such stress. I've always had a lot of terrible shit going on with my teeth I inherited my mother's mother's mouth and I know that because I once went to her dentist in LA and the dentist was like oh my god you have the exact same mouth as your grandmother um cool. and it's very small the jaw is really small we have to use child size like molds and stuff um my teeth have given me nothing but trouble they're crooked as shit now, even though I had braces. I've had to have surgeries. I've had, it's just like my, the enamel didn't grow. Everything went wrong with my teeth. Um, so, you know, there's this classic, like when you, you know, you're dreaming that your teeth fall out. This is a very standard kind of Freudian idea of insecurity or, um, you know, fear of failure or something. Um, I actually, see, I'm like looking at myself and saying, <laughs> I actually really like that my teeth are very crooked now. And this is something in the in Minerva, in the erotic encyclopedia, crooked teeth mm -hmm. or chipped or damaged teeth. Mm -hmm. There's something I find very um, unnerving about how everyone's teeth in Hollywood now, like on TV and in movies, are just like these perfect mm -hmm. white, fake, mm -hmm. they really unnerve me, mm -hmm. everyone's fake teeth. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that it's hard to cast people for like medieval films, et cetera, because they don't, nobody has like medieval teeth. <laughs> yeah, I, this is probably not the same problem they would have casting in Germany. Um, <laughs> I'm, so I'm in Berlin right now and Asher's in LA. Um, yeah. It's but a very it, American value, perfect yeah. teeth. Yeah, and very yeah. disturbing, I mean, there's so many American values around control of the body. Yeah. Yeah, in ways that very painful for people. Yeah, it's deep. It's Maybe. deep. Um, I mean, I think just like, you know, not that I live anywhere really exotic, but just living in a, in a society. I live primarily in, in Berlin, and then I come home to LA every year for several months, even though I'm not 
sadly probably going to make it this year because of COVID, but um, living in Berlin is just kind of um, been a re-education in certain, in how like some values that, you know, like there are a lot of women with wrinkles here, whereas in LA, that does not happen. But it, do you do feel, what's, what does it feel like to be in Berlin versus LA bodily? Um, well, the primary difference is that in America, there's a just background bodily tension of my health. Like I could get shot because there are guns mm -hmm. or if I get sick, healthcare is, you know, I'm going to go bankrupt mm -hmm. because of healthcare. Mm -hmm. That general stress is not here in Germany because my health insurance just fucking works. There's no such thing as a deductible or the copay is... So the other day, okay, here's, an, here's the story. I think I've told it in a couple of situations, but like my doctor was giving me a medication that I don't take a lot. So I only get it maybe once every two years. And he's like, oh, but I'm sorry, your insurance is not going to cover it. And I was like, okay. You know, and in America, this could mean that you're going to pay $800. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, how much is it going to be? And it's like, it's going to be 15 euros. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, right. See, like in Germany, you could get pissed off at that number. You could be like 15 euros. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I never think about this stuff until I meet people who are in other countries where, yeah, you don't think about getting shot. I, it, it being shot is the background. Yeah. And literally a reality for many people here. Yeah. Um, and I don't think about that as a condition that I'm living in until I hear something like this. Yeah. And also the, the healthcare thing, I mean, you know. It's just like this vagus nerve, um, stress that is not here when I'm in Berlin. And and in terms of your like physical body with like wrinkles and teeth and blood and and fat. Yeah. I don't well I don't really think about aesthetic like like I like that I have crooked teeth and gray hair. Like I'm like so proud of my like gray hair that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Um in a way that like is a statement to say that in LA and in Berlin, nobody gives a shit. They're all like, what? Like, of course you're gonna have crooked teeth and gray hair and wrinkles, duh. Yeah. Like you're a person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I, I, this kind of leads me to the question of the erotic in your poetry and in, in your work in general. Um, is it okay if I say that you kind of said that you feel embarrassed by your Poetry. Well, I don't feel embarrassed by my poetry because of the erotic part. No, 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 I, I'm um, not saying that. But yeah, um, yeah, we can talk about this. The <laughs> fact that there are poems in this book makes me deeply um, embarrassed. Why? Because I find poetry to be the most embarrassing art form, period. And I think like this is, this is like, a, I have like a little Pisces theory with this dance poetry and music to a certain extent, which are the Piscean arts. To me, they are mostly bad when they happen. And it's so uh, painful, like to watch bad dance. It's like the worst thing you've ever seen, right? It's like, and it's like cringe, like the vulnerability is just so, uh, and the embarrassment that you feel for these people. Same with bad music um, to a certain extent, but for sure, the, for me, the most is with bad poetry. When there's bad poetry, it's just, I just, oh, uh, like I want to die for the person, you know, mm -hmm. like it's just so terrible. Why, why? And I think, well, I think that the reason is because these three arts, when they are good, oh, there's nothing better. They're like transcendent, you know, they like feed you in a very basic primordial way. Yeah. That like a masterpiece movie or a novel, 
you know, and I would like kind of put theater in this a little bit because mm-hmm. um, it's the same kind of thing with dance where you see like people's bodies and they're trying so hard on the stage, you know. Um, I guess that the embarrassment thing for me happens because of this raw kind of basic food thing that I'm talking about is, is, is you know, potentially there. Mm-hmm. Like, so with poems, I started out, you know, when I was a young person and wanted to be a writer, I was like, oh, well, clearly you write poems. Like, that's what you do. So I tried to write them. And I've talked about this and even made a project where I called myself a failed poet. I think I am not a poet. Um, I think I failed at being a poet. Why? I don't, I don't think I know what poetry is. And I feel like, (laughs) I mean, I feel like if you are around a real poet, like a poet, they know what it is. And Mm -hmm. they talk about it in this way that's like, it's like the Ten Commandments. It's like, oh, clearly that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Even though there are no rules, really, they're just talking about what it's supposed to do and what it, what its power is. Who are those people? Oh, like, I mean, like Anne Boyer is like that. Um, C.A. Conrad is like that. Oh. Um, I haven't, you know, really spoken to her uh, personally, although she, we've, we've had a correspondence um, over email, but Banu Kapil is like that. And these are all people that I really, really, really admire. Mm. And I just feel like, oh, right, like you're in a world that I don't know about. Mm. Mm. Um, Anne Carson, I think, is like that. Mm. And Anne Carson, I think, is very clearly squatting on this book. Um, mm mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not a poet in in the like I mean maybe this sounds like I'm being like falsely modest or something but I really think that I don't really understand poetry in the way that real poets understand it. Right. I I I mean I don't know that I understand it enough to even ask questions about it. So <laughs> Well, the, well this is just, like what is it? I don't know. It's don't like know. this magic I don't know. I don't know either, but I, I, I can't say, you know, not to, and I'm definitely not trying to be modest, but I, I wish I did, but I don't understand theater or art or art forms or anything of that nature. And maybe that's just part of it, you know what I mean? What did you say before we pressed record that you're just like, you, you don't, you're not good with facts? I'm not good with facts or anything. <laughs> I anything. can't plug in uh, anything like an iron I can't plug in. No, but and then I was saying that I remember there was some workshop once at Machine Project where you turned an LED on with your mind. <laughs> I don't know. You say that. I don't remember. I'm sad. That, that was like the word on the street. That was the gossip. Oh, Do really? you know Asher turned this LED <laughs> on with his mind? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I think the world eludes me, actually. Is that the right word? And I don't even well, know. Okay. Can we, can I ask you then about this? Because I, I think that one of the things that you and I maybe share, and I've certainly learned a lot from watching you work, is that your practice, right, is not just, it's not a theater practice in a conventional way. It's not a performance art practice in a conventional way. Writing practice, I mean, you, you, you are a painter too, like, and, and all of these things sort of live outside of the worlds that they're supposed to live in. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, I take a lot of inspiration from that, but I think that it's also like, can you talk about navigating these different worlds and how you kind of have this maybe transgression against where things are supposed to belong and what that means? Yeah, maybe. And maybe not to circle back to the, to the book, but it feels like this particular book is also a kind of transgression of what a book's supposed to do. Um, but for me, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have ever intended to be against theater or against performance. It's just that it, it normally it, or naturally happens that it, it, it is that. And maybe I'm just against anything, you know, like. <laughs> but I don't especially want, facts. Yeah, especially facts. I don't want to be, but I never seem to be able to do it the right way. And I, and I do recall even from from childhood, not understanding anything, uh, like literally anything, like what is money or like, how do I tie my shoe? I couldn't tie my shoe until I was like, at least in the, I think first grade, like that's bad. 
But then I watched my dad try to put a coffee filter in one time, which was an exercise in, in peril. He, was, he <laughs> almost died putting in that filter because he was struggling with it and then, he, uh, and then he fell backwards and he hit his his back, his coccyx, which is his favorite oh, word. No. Yeah, <laughs> just to put in this filter. And you, you, I mean, I think I come from that. He really could not do a lot of things. But aren't you a lot of Aries in your family? <laughs> yes. Aries in the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally, uh, yeah, cannot function. Uh, <laughs> although my sister is very, she's very good. She functions. She's a high functioning mm -hmm. person. A high functioning but, person. Yeah, but I guess, I guess, in terms of like theater, I don't like, and this brings us back to catharsis and Aristotle, etc. I don't like the convention of American theater, and mm -hmm. it's it's a very, um, it, it's it's uh, this idea of story is very difficult for me to swallow this idea that we tell stories and you know due respect to storytellers i love to go to a movie i love beginning middle and end and like oh, okay the dog came home i love all of that you know i feel like well what happened what happened i am that viewer but when i work or when i make work i don't see the way in which story or even narrativizing functions well in our psyche it doesn't mm -hmm. work and when i'm reading people almost everyone, including myself, they have the story. This happened because this, I'm like this, because my mother, my father, my grandfather. Great, you know that. And may, maybe that's actually not true. And what would you do if it wasn't true? And what what would you do if there were complications around that? And so I see well, something as like that. Go ahead, sorry. No, because I was gonna say it's so interesting because when I see your work and when I see your plays, I'm now like thinking about it. It's like, right, there's not really like a plot per se, but I get the sense that your characters do go through some sort of, right? Like the, I guess the, the vehicle of story is to move your characters from one place to the next. So they change, right? That's the big value. So I do think of them as doing that in your work, but it's interesting now that I think about it, right? There's not really like the apparatus of the plot per se doing that. Right. So, I mean, this idea, I think catharsis is really an interesting thing to talk about because I think ritual catharsis, you know, um, where the, 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 the city state catharts together around a political problem that was, you know, heretofore unseen and it's now seen and we can all understand cathart and bring it into consciousness right. is really phenomenally important. Um, but I think the way that it's been translated to me, and I really do want to respect people who write things that I happily consume, but the way that I understand it is that in a t traditional narrative, you know, the character must change. They start out, you know, usually it's the hero's journey, right? You know, I right. start out, I don't yeah, know, yeah. I'm just a farm boy. Then I have this issue, I see the Gorgon, I fail, and then I find something out about myself, and then I succeed, and then Denima. And I find that not true in my life. I've lived enough yeah. to, to, to be befuddled by that idea. And it's very depressing to me because that has not occurred in my life. Yeah, but I think it's interesting because the, I just finished uh, a novel that I've been working on for six years. And I can't tell you how many fucking times I Googled what is a plot <laughs> while I was fucking writing this book. And I still don't know. Like, I still don't know. The only thing that has ever resonated with me in terms of what is a plot, like, how do you write one? Um, I read in a New Yorker profile of the writer of the show Deadwood, uh -huh. whose name I can't remember, but he said the plot is the character's emotional response. Well, I like that. That's the only one that I can, like, remember and make sense to me. That does make sense. Um, and I think, I think people who write plot really well are great strategists and very smart. And I really admire it, but I can't remember the plot in a conversation. No, like, me neither. Same, same. Like, I, can, I don't know what happened in the movie. I know what certain scenes felt like. Totally. 
I can tell you who the actors were. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so in Venom, you know, the alien monster, and there's a battle at the end. Like, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. And also that outfit where there was like jewels yeah. on that, you know, or yeah. um, somebody yeah. thinking about breakfast, I know, in their scene, and they're like, they're riding their motorcycle thinking about Linguini. You know that. <laughs> you know, like, that's really interesting to me. But yeah. the other stuff isn't, and I think, yeah, I think that that idea that we, um, particularly Americans, fashion our lives along this narrative, is particularly destructive to people. Yeah. Um, particularly the one of like you, you, you go to school, you graduate, you succeed, you get whatever circle what you want, and then you win and you go home. Mm. Very well, this is also I think why with astrology, like I'm the kind of astrologer, like I think at this point. I don't advertise, but I've been reading for clients for six years, seven years. And at this point, I think I'm known like that you come to me when everything is fucked up. It's not worked out the way you wanted it. You're collapsed. You're devastated. You have nothing. And you're like, what happened? I think I'm the right astrologer for that kind of a situation because I'm like, well, that's like how it goes. That's how life works. Like fate is like that. No matter what decision you had made and you decided to drive in your little car to go to school, to graduate, to get the job, whatever, you know, that kind of doesn't matter. Like what if the God of war has it out for you? You know, like. <laughs> we love that because that then is a greater sense. Well, this is also why I like these ancient, why I so love the ancient Greeks and why I use their mythology and their, astrology is because it predates this psychological invention of the self this like individual self-actualizing discrete identity you know that does things you know it's that's an invention and it's a relatively recent invention um i think that i get a lot of solace from a time when stories or people or events you know, were shaped by things that weren't just scaled down to an individual's choice. Yes. You know? Yes. And or parentage or, yeah. um, I don't know, outward yeah. identity. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Freud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's very interesting and it's helpful, but it's not the whole thing. And the more that I, read people the more you know i've also been doing my practice for i think now probably almost 20 years it's people are incredibly fascinating and incredibly multifarious they i mean if that's a really bad phrase but you know what i'm saying they're just they're just so yeah. many not even humans in a human that's that's the thing that's really fascinating is that they're entities that aren't even human yeah so um the, and I think going back to like the structure of theater or your book, et cetera, like this idea, and it's, it happens a lot in these kind of like maybe um, categorized practices like fiction writing or novels or, you know, theater that, that we have a very myopic or even sort of like attenuated sense of what these things are supposed to be. So I'm curious how you arrived, arrived? That's not even a word. How you arose, arrived? Ar yeah, I kind of arrived and arisen. How did you arrive at your structure for the book? Oh, that's a good question. Also, just maybe we keep a look at the clock. I have oh, not yeah. been. Um, uh, this is a good question. So. At some point, the shape-shifting quality of this book was the thing that convinced me it was a book. The first piece and the last piece were always there. And I say this in the afterword, that the first piece was always Euripides is not a genius, I am this long essay about these Greek plays. And then the last piece was this play I did in the desert with Machine Project and High Desert Test Sites. Um, and they just were bookends always because of what they personally represented to me. They were around the same time. I had made the desert play right after I finished doing the Greek plays. So it just sort of made sense to me. It was like, in my mind, I was like, okay, this is the time period. Um, but
but the guts got pulled out and re-put in like that book went through so many bodies like there were pieces that I had originally intended to be in this book that I wrote for this book that are not in there um, that I pulled out at the last minute that I wrote and then didn't you know it ended up not being a good fit and this is the thing is like I don't really know why it wasn't a good fit because at some point I realized that I didn't really know like what even the book was Mm. This is what I mean is like, I tried to make it a poetry book where I had these two pieces on the end and then it was just poetry. And then that didn't work at all. So then I took out all the poetry and put in just essays and that didn't work. And so then at some point, I guess they started to make sense in terms of certain themes, even though the themes are, one of the themes I think is sleep. One of the themes I think is like rage. But, you know, these are still very vague. So I don't even know if thematically there's much of a scaffolding. Um, I think what just started to feel right is that this lawlessness thing I'm talking about, like what you said, like it transgresses even against being a book at all. I think that's what made it coalesce in a way where I was like, okay, right. This is like, none of these things I've been trying to force it into. And it's, it felt really good when it became a decade. Um, And that just sort of worked out by virtue of fate of it kind of going around the publishing odyssey and not happening. And then finally happening in 2020. Um, When it, when the date, you know, when Vivian, the publisher and I decided on the date, she was like, well, when do you want to publish it? And I was like, I think the nerve is a Virgo. Um, that was like <laughs> the only condition. Um, so when that happened, it was like, oh, it's a decade of work. Like, so, I mean, I have said that the only consistent like character in the book is Los Angeles. And maybe the other consistent character is this decade of 2010 to 2020, Mm -hmm. Um, like a time and a place, but I don't know really about who exactly Minerva is, Mm -hmm. It's like who's showing up at that time and place. Right. And the massive changes between 2010 and 2020, I mean. Yeah. I mean, you know, in a really, um, like a cancer moon looking fondly back at the past and crying um where i started in 2010 and where i ended up in 2020 are like two vastly different people can you tell so on some personal level well yeah like on some personal level that is significant i i don't know how much of that will come through to the reader when i i mean i talk about it in the afterward that when i started doing those plays those greek plays i was freshly divorced from an abusive husband i was fresh out of the psych ward where i had been involuntarily hospitalized um, by a man i was kind of really starkly encountering the patriarchy i think because it fucking played out its war in my bed like it didn't matter what my politics were. It was like my whole life was constructed um, and decided upon by these dudes. Um, And so I had to kind of deal with this, you know, like, well, did I have anything to do with bringing, inviting these men in? Like, could I have somehow gotten out of the involuntary hospitalization that the man like called in on me? So I think the decade for me started in this place. I was also really kind of dealing with like gender dysphoria and just figuring out my own gender identity. And also I was like a young artist trying to like figure out my work and what I wanted to do with my career or my life or my practice, whatever. I remember um in like 2008 i started at ucla and i remember thinking to myself like my dream would be to have a show at machine project um 
to me. So on some level, like, yeah, there is like a narrative over the decade that is like a happy ending on some level because mm -hmm. on 2020, you know, I feel like the person I am now and the life that I'm living is so very far away from that as a starting point in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Yeah, like maybe that's like the, the plot is that they defeated the patriarchy in this decade. Well, not the whole patriarchy, but the one in my life. Very hopeful. I know. <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah. And also maybe I'm like, yeah, remediating my Mars. So my rage is a bit more, I don't want to say healthy because I think that's a weird uh, conception of rage. But I think my rage is, um, I get to use it rather than it using me. Ah, uh, what a great, great way to think about that. <laughs> Shall we talk about Did arrows we? briefly or? Cause, yeah, cause we didn't, arrows, we didn't, the erotic. Yeah, can you talk about that in poetry a little bit and in language or is that too vague a question? Like as if they're different? They're, no, not at all. I don't know that they are, but it, it's a general question of like where you find the erotic in your, in your work, either written, performed, spoken, felt. Well, this is maybe some like bigger, I don't know what proposal that maybe I'm trying to say about writing being language embodied and talking about catharsis in terms of writing. I think catharsis happens in writing also. I don't think it's like, yes, Aristotle, you have to like go to the theater to have it. But I also think that catharsis can happen when you're reading something. You know, Anthony McCann, the poet, talks about the necrosocial mm -hmm. um, and poetics particularly and writing in general, but poetry as being the space where you commune with the dead in a necrosocial space. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's also true when I feel like I'm writing. I feel like I'm communing with all of these different references, right? Etymologies, histories. Uh, when I write, I usually keep I mean, I write at this desk and I usually keep um, stacks of books on my desk. And when I get stuck, I will open them. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is to just write verbatim, like take a book and write a sentence from that book verbatim into my manuscript and then go through word by word and change the words to antonyms or synonyms. Um, and this is like to get at a syntax that's maybe different than the one I would do. But it's also like a kind of communion with, in an erotic way, like I'll pick up, like when I was writing Minerva, I did look a lot, I did have Ann Carson's books, they're like right above my head here. Um, I did have her on the desk a lot and I would just pick them up and open them and she's she references, I mean, she's got some Gemini in that chart. She's like referencing Monica Vitti and Simone Weil and the same mm. place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like there's an erotics to me in terms of this congregation that happens mm -hmm. when you write, when you read mm -hmm. all the voices, all of the histories. Um, I mean, the piece in Minerva that everything is erotic, therefore everything is exhausting is sort of like a, a cheeky, you know, proposal that just like everything is erotic. So like, if you think about it, um, anything can be erotic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's that uh, quote that Audrey of Audrey Lords from the uses of the erotic that opens that text where she says it's it's about how much you can feel in the doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that like when I'm writing, that is what's happening is I'm trying to like feel into a word as much as I can or a sentence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great. Yeah, it happens maybe more in my fiction too, which, yeah, this novel I was working on for six years, hopefully that'll come out at some point. Um, 
but in that way it's also very real where you can you you know you decorate the room or the, the scene or the character's mind or interiority in a way that you know has to me it's an erotic exercise mm-hmm. to write your characters yeah oh deeply yeah yeah, yeah. well this has been fascinating yeah maybe that's a good one to end on yeah i think it could be we've been we we've, we've been chatting for a bit okay yeah what do you think i think it's great i'm not so happy to do it with you yeah vice versa Be- beautiful one day we'll have to have a discussion about theater writing poetry astrology and psychic space another conversation about it <laughs> Another I feel like we've been having, we just we've been having a conversation about this stuff for like almost 10 years now. I know, but it's really fun. Maybe I just, see, I lost the thread. <laughs> We're already in it. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for whoever is going to watch this and yeah. tuning in. We appreciate yes. it. Thanks for communing with us. Yeah. Thank you, Johanna. Your Thanks, work is so special and you're so special. Well, it's greatly informed by you and your practice oh. and our relationship hugely. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's really kind. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stop this recording.